Great, so welcome everyone. I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, let me know if you see it. Hopefully you all see it. Uh, so this is, as you know, um, it's gonna be a short and very basic tutorial on XPEC. So I'll start asking again, you know, if you haven't, please go to the link, which I'm gonna copy now to download the data that we're gonna use right now. So I'm gonna go through an example and I can find the chat window. What is the chat window now? Sure. I lost the, the chat here. Okay, I'm copying the link here just in case. And the second link I want to share is probably the most important one and is the link to the manual of XPEC because um, that really contains all the information you might ever need. And to be honest, a lot of people don't really read the manuals, including myself. So there is a lot of things that I've learned just by looking at other people. Like, oh, I didn't know you can do that. And of course it's all in the manuals, just you know whether you are you take the time to go through it. So um, again, I'm gonna go through quick a quick example to, I, I think the best way to learn this things is just by doing it yourself. So uh, hopefully you all gonna, gonna try to do things with me as I go through. Uh, if you prefer not to, because you prefer just to focus and pay attention, that's perfectly fine. Again, this is being recorded, so you can always go to the video go back and kind of look uh, what we've done. So um, things that I'm not going to cover here are have to do with data reduction. So the files I'll send, I'll send you are, have been already processed using the Newstar pipeline. And that's gonna be covered on Monday by Brian. So, um, we're going to start assuming that you all already either know how to do it or or somebody did it for you, uh, which is the case. And the files that you all should have are these ones. Uh, you see a series of files. The basic structure here is this is a, a single observation of a black hole binary called GX339-4. And um, there are two set of files, as you can see, there, is, there are some files. That, let me start by saying just the, the first number is, a, is an OPS ID number that identifies this particular Again. observation. Yes. Can you, can you make it bigger, the, the terminal? And also... The, the font, you mean? The font, yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, perfect. Okay. All right. That's good to know, yeah. I thought it was big enough already. So anyway, so the, the number there are many details that I'm gonna go through fast, but just for you to know this number in front of the file identifies the observation, it's the OPS ID of, the, of this particular case. And then you're gonna see there is a group that uh, refers to A and the other one to B, and that those are the two uh, focal modules in NUSTAR. NUSTAR has essentially two almost identical detectors that take data at the same time. And it's just a way of having some redundancy and it's a way to have, in a way, also more data having the same exposure, right? If you observe the same source for say 20 kiloseconds, um, you get twice the data because you have two detectors, which will be in a in, uh, general way, almost like observing for twice the time. <laughs> so um, the, Again, the, the structure of the files and how you get to hear from the actual data that is downlink from the observatory is gonna be covered uh, later by Brian, but it suffice for you to know that there is, there's gonna be one file that has to do with the spectrum that con contains the spectrum, you know, the, the counts versus energy that, it, that I observe, and it's this file, <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, and then there are other files associated to this that have to do with the, for, for example, the effective area, 
or they have to, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm signal this, but this is the actual file, the source.dha. Then there is, there is a file that has to do with the effective area. There is a file that has to do with the response of the instrument. And there is a file that contains the background. So these are all the products that you normally should get out of a reduction mm -hmm. process. And then there is this last two files, which um, they're not necessarily standard from the reduction, but it's something that you should uh, probably also care about, which is the same observation, but it has been rebin. It has been, the data has been grouped in, in a way such as um, you increase the signal in some channels. And I'm gonna try to explain this briefly. I really hope Brian uh, goes over this in, in his, in his um, talk. So let's just start with expect, assuming that everybody has um, everything installed, you just invoke ex expect in this way. And the first thing we're, we're gonna do is just load the data. Uh, for that, you uh, you type the command load, uh, sorry, that's for the model, sorry. You say data, and I personally think it's good practice to tell the, the group uh, of the data that you're gonna, that it's gonna be assigned. If you don't say anything, it will do it by default, but I'd like to do it um, just so I know exactly what I'm doing. So one column one and, and then the observation file, which in this case is gonna be, we're gonna start with the ungroup one, the one that comes out of from the reduction procedure. This guy here. If you do this, then and everything goes fine, then expect is gonna show you a bunch of information. It of course tells you the name of the file. It says what's the count rate and that was that was observed, yeah, counts per second, in this case ADA. It says it's been a the data is assigned to group one. This is what we say here. And then number of channels notice. So the way that the observation comes is in channels. You have a number of channels in the detector and each channel re register certain amount of counts per second. So that's that's what you're getting as raw data. And there are this many for 4,096 channels. It tells you the telescope, the instrument is a focal point module A, and then the exposure time that you have. In this case, it's about 20 kiloseconds. So 20,000 20, seconds was exposure. Uh, as I also mentioned the statistics, we'll, we'll cover that a little bit later. And it shows all the other files, the associated files that I mentioned, the background. Uh, it, it tells what the exposure of the background is because it's, there is a possibility that you have a different exposure. That's not the case here. Um, and it tells you what is the, what, what it expert loaded as response and, and auxiliary response. So this is the effective area. And this happens automatically, right? Um, but it, it happens automatically because this file, this observation file, the .bha has been produced in the right way containing that information that that file should be associated to these other files. It's not that expect is magically knows this. It, it knows it because it's, it's contained in, in your observation file. If I just I should mention in general this might not be the case. You might encounter cases in which the source spectrum was produced uh, in a way that doesn't contain this information. So you can always do it by hand. You can always there are commands, for example, the response. Um, I, by the way, almost any command you can have a, an abbreviation um, in expect. So if I do rest. Also, I can I can provide what's the response file that I want for this observation. The same is for the ARF, and the same for uh, the background. You can say back, and then the name of the file and it's going to associate those files to the observation you have. In this case, you don't need to. It's been it's, it's been done already by expect, and it should be almost always the case if. It's not a big deal uh, just to have this association made it, made already. Okay, so um, when you're dealing with NUSTAR data, 
as I mentioned, there are two modules taking data at the same time, all the time. So for any observation, you're always gonna have that second, the second uh, data that you can load as well. So we're gonna do it this way. We're gonna assign it to the to group two, right? And in this case, the only difference is the letter of the module. So you do that and then same thing happens. The information is not identical because it's a different detector, but it's pretty close. And this one again has all the associated files according to that particular observation. So this is the, the first thing you have to do. If you are later on the process and you forgot about this information, say you don't have it in the screen anymore, you can always say show data. And it will show you what kind of, you know, what, which data you have loaded at any particular moment. So that's useful to know. All right, so the next thing I like to do is just look at things. So you're gonna open your, your plotting uh, environment, cpd slash xw. And if your installation were fine, you should all see a PG plot window open like this. Feel free to interrupt me anytime if you have questions. Okay, so, um, I'm gonna type commands the full way as much as I can, but I, I'm used to type it in, in a short way because expert and understands that. So for example, plot data is the very first thing you could do that will show you the two observations. Uh, but for example, I could do PLD and expert understand that's actually plot data. Um, you you will realize this as you get more used to working with XP. But anyway, here you're plotting the counts per, per second per channel. And as I mentioned, what you get is the raw spectrum is, is in channels at the moment, instrument channels, right? So there are 4,000 something channels. This is the full data that you get. And the two colors are just the two, the two modules, A and B, right? A useful way to plot data is to plot it in, in log scale. So for that, you can do plot L data, and then that will do it in, in log scale. And then you, you see it a little bit better what's, uh, what the spectrum looks like. And, and we'll, we're gonna explain a little bit what is this. This is just very high energies. Um, you're, not, you're not seeing many counts. Each Channel has a count rate and it has an error bar associated with that detection. So over here, your error bars are just pretty big. And since you're plotting in log scale, it just makes this, this weird thing. Okay, but um, we're physicists and we like to work with physical units. So instead of having a detector channels, we're gonna plot this in a physical unit that we understand, in this case, energy. So for this, you do set plot. Again, you can set just set P for set plot and then energy. And then if you plot again, PL, now it plots the spectrum, the same counts per second, but now per KV, which is uh, the energy, the photon energy that, that was measured. This information, the, the, the mapping between detector channels and energy is actually contained in the response file. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I think somebody's in the chat. Okay, no mind. Silence this, all right. So, um, let me get out of here. Um, so now you see the full spectrum, all the data that was taken in energy. However, <clears throat> for reasons that uh, maybe are not super important right now, not every, not the entire range is, um, is trustworthy. So the people that are much smarter than me, like uh, Brian and Christine had uh, given recommendations of what's the part of the spectrum that we really trust and we should consider for science. And that's nominally between three and 79 KV. So the next commands are to do exactly that, to just notice or ignore uh, different parts of the data that you, you need to, whenever you need to do that. So these are the two commands. There's one that is ignore, 
that will ignore data as you tell them. And the other one is notice that will just do that. We'll do the inverse, we'll, we'll notice channels. So if we say ignore, um, the first thing you need to tell is which spectrum. In this case, uh, since you have two, you can say one dash two, that will be ignoring in both of them, then colon, and then what is it that you want to ignore? And here there is a subtlety because you can ignore channels or you can ignore energies. And the only way to tell expect which one you're referring to is by having a dot or not. So for example, if I want to ignore um, from 79 kV to um, infinity, say, uh, I'll do it this way with double star is infinity, but the 79 needs to be a dot because, because this is a way expect understand is energy and no channel. So let me show you what that does. If I do that, then it says, okay, this many channels were ignored in a spectrum one and a spectrum two. And if you plot that, you see that now the data just extends to 79 kV. If I revert this by noticing what I just ignore, then I got all my data back, right? But for example, let's say I do the mistake and I say 79 without the dot, then it understands that it needs to ignore from channel 79, which could be a very different energy from what I wanted. If I plot that, it says, I don't know what it did. It did nothing. Oh, you sorry, noticed. Not it. Yeah. So I want to do ignore, which I can just do in the compressed way. Let's see. There you go. So what it has ignored a lot more, right? It's two, three, four, maybe five kb in above. So you see how it's important to um, make the difference between the dot and the not dot. You can also do the double star at the beginning here to if you have many spectra and you want to do it on everything, you can always do double star and then understand it's everything. And if you want to notice absolutely everything, I guess this is like this maybe, yeah. Then you get all your data back, right? And this is um, this is not really. A, it might be obvious, but just to clarify, it's not like you're deleting things. You're not modifying the actual files. It's just whether expert considers this data for the analysis or not. Okay. So let's go back to ignoring. Um, above 79 kV. So you get rid of that part that looked not so great. And then the other thing is uh, below 3 kV, you also need to ignore because below 3 kV, uh, what happens to the detector is not, it's not very trustworthy. So we're gonna do the same, ignore for all the spectra from zero to three. And in both cases, I do the dot to say that um, there is an energy. So there you go. This is the nominal recommended band pass for NUSTAR data. There are cases in which this might need to be different depending on your background. Now I will get that in, well, maybe just right now. So a way that you can, you have your background in this case, again, if you do show data, it shows you that in both spectra, you have a background associated, a background file. Um, so that tells you what's the level of you know, noise that is not coming from your observed, from your source, it's coming from something else, right? Um, and you want to remove that, that, that part of, uh, from the data. So if you want to see how, how this looks like, you do set plot back, and if you plot again now, it shows you your background for both modules. So all these points are the level of your background. So you see a low energy, the source is very bright. There's many, many source counts. So the background is, is relatively unimportant. But as you go to higher energies, they become compatibles. So depending on your observation, depending on the source, on the particular case, maybe on the exposure, um, the level of background might be 
uh, too low with respect to the source, or could be actually quite high. And say if it is somewhere around around one in this case, you might need to ignore data uh, even you know even before much before the 79 recommended 79 kV recommended value, because if your background is dominant, then you might have um, situation where the data is not very very trustworthy. Okay, so um, this is, let's say this is all good for now. Let's just move forward. And let's just start with defining a model. And if you just type model in XPEC, it will, without anything else, it will give you a list of all the included models. In, in my system, in, the, in this case, I have models that have been added beyond what comes with the standard installation. So all those models are marked with the asterisk. So you might not have all of this in your system, but the rest, everything that doesn't have this star, you should have it. So there are essentially three types of models. There are additive models, multiplicative models, and convolution models. And of course they do different things. So a simple example of an additive model is a Gaussian profile for say fitting a, uh, an emission line, for example, that is something that you add to whatever continuum you might have. Pretty much any continuum model is an additive model. So a power law, a black body are the, the two very simple cases of models for the continuum. Those are typically additive. Multiplicative models are something that multiply something else. So they can they cannot exist by, by themselves. They, they need to multiply some other model component. And they usually, uh, I think almost in any case, they're going to cause absorption because that's what absorption does. You, you take something, say a, a, some, some a continuum model, something that represents what is the mission in X-rays for the continuum, and you multiply by something else that was gonna reduce uh, the flux that you observe at certain energies. So almost, I'll say no, not almost every absorption model is has to be multiplicative. Um, I think it's actually the case that pretty much every model in here is is in fact an absorption model. And then convolution models, which are a bit more complicated, they do they modify features in your in your in your the rest of the model parameters so they're they can do things like smoothing out your spectrum for reasons that um, depends on the physics that you're trying to describe so um, something that we work a lot with is relativistic reflection models and these include this convolution which is shifting the energies of the photons around depending on properties of the black hole so this is done through a convolution model, which is just a mathematical thing. And I'm noticing now that there are mixing models, which actually I don't know what they are. Does anybody know what these mixing models are? I don't know. Or, to be honest, it's the first time I see it. Um, and then there is this pileup model. Pileup is a is an instrumental effect. A very high cam rates. I think these are more advanced topics and we're just not going to cover right now. So for the moment, I think you should just concern about these three cases, the additive, the multiplicative, and the, even the convolution model, we're, we're just not going to do it right now, maybe later. Okay, so typically the first thing you want to do is to define a model for your continuum. So in this case, I already know a good model, by the way, you can just type mo and understand this model or you can type model. And then you say the name of the model that you want to add, we're gonna start with a power law. So it says, if I say Po, I understand this power law. And now, it, now I start showing what the model parameters are. This is a simple power law model. So it has only two parameters. One is the photon index for the power law. And the information right before, it shows what are the limits for this parameter. So it shows, it actually is, is, is self-explained here. It shows the, the value, the value that is taken at the moment. The delta means the, the steps that it's gonna to take to vary that parameter. And then there are two, two minimums and two maximum values. Um, 
within which the this parameter is allowed to be varied. And all these numbers can be, most of the times, they can be modified at, at will as, as you want. If you type enter, it will take the default, which is one. Uh, the next parameter is the normalization, same deal. You can just type enter and it will take the default, which is also one. Uh, but that was for the first spectrum, for the first um, data that you loaded. Now uh, it, it will ask the same for the second, um, if you want to define these values or not. And if you type enter, what it will do is to assign the same values as the first spectrum. So now this is an important table that you will see a lot. This is your actual, uh, I hope you see what I'm marking with the mouse, what I'm highlighting. It's, it shows you what the model is at the moment. It shows the list of parameters, the list of components, and it shows each one of those parameters, which value they have. What is the error associated to that value? But this comes later after you do an actual fit. And in this case, so this is for data group one was that first spectrum that we loaded for, for the focal point module A. And then this is for the module B, the data group two. And you can see here that for these two parameters they have equal P1 and P2 means that they're linked to parameter one. And this one is linked to parameter two. So whichever value these, these two guys take, these two are gonna take the same value. So in short, what you're doing at this moment is you're assigning exactly the same model to both spectrum with no difference whatsoever, okay? And then there is a whole bunch of other information that comes back at you that have to do with the statistics, right? In this case, <coughs> you're, um, these, these are some of the things that are maybe more advanced and I'm just gonna gloss over, but we can discuss them later. There is a fit statistics and there is a test statistics. Uh, and one is used to actually go through the minimization process to find the best values of those parameters that fit your data. And the other one is just a number to test how good the, that particular fit is. In this case, both statistics are the same. It's, it's called chi-square. Uh, but there, are, there is an, an, a different possibilities for both cases that you can choose from. We're not gonna cover that right now. We're just gonna go with chi-square, which is by far the most uh, used one in X-ray astronomy. Um, for the purpose of this example, um, it suffice to say that what we want is for this chi-square to be low, and in particular, this number, which is called the reduced chi-square. And reduce is because it's the, this number, the chi-square over the number of degrees of freedom, which is printed here. We want this number to be close to one, essentially. So for, again, there is more to it than this. But for, for now, let's say your mission in life is to get a fit that makes this number close to one. And you can see we're way too far from that. So if, um, if I will just plot the model that we just defined, which is this power law, and I just use, you know, use the, this default values that I have no idea whether they're good or bad. Now I see the model is way up here. And this is why your chi-square is so terrible. It's, it's, it's way too far. So every time you set up a model, every time you make a change, um, is it's a good practice to renormalize the model. And for that, you use the command called renorm. So what this will do is just shift the entire model very quickly without going to any sort of minimization process, just to try to match as close as the observation as it can. And if you look at the chi-square now, it went substantially lower. It was, I don't know how much it was, 3000 or something, 36,000. Now it's, it's 133, which is extremely large still, but much better than before. And that's because if you plot the model again, then uh, you see that it just it, it brought it down towards the level of the data. So this is helpful because this is done by just essentially changing one number. It doesn't have to do any model evaluation, any weird stuff. Um, 
when you're working with more complicated models, the problem is if you don't renormalize, it will the algorithm will spend a lot of time trying to find the best fit, starting from a place that is just too far away. So it's sort of like a waste of time. Sometimes the fit can even get lost in a, in a weird situation because of uh, you started too far from what the real solution should be. Uh, so it's always a very good practice to renormalize before doing anything else. And you can see it always says this warning fit is not current because we haven't done any fitting yet. Uh, before I go to the fitting stuff, uh, let me stop for a minute, see if there are any questions. Everybody's doing good. Everybody's awake. Yeah. Oh, right. I wrote oh. a. Oh, go ahead. Well, I wrote a question in the chat about- oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't, I'm not looking at the chat. It's kind of hard when I'm sharing my screen. I don't know where it puts things. Oh, it's okay. I was just before when we were looking at the models, like additive stuff. Yes. Um, I didn't see that Rex so was in my additive model. So I wanted to see if that was like, if that was a problem. No, uh, it should be, it should be there. We'll, we'll cover, RELSIL is a whole model that, that contains a few things all together in the same sort of package. So it, as, as an as a entity, it does act as, as, a, as, as an additive model. So that's fine, but we, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Okay. We're going okay. baby steps right now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And I didn't mention much about it because I don't, I don't know if everybody has it installed and not everybody will need it in this call. So um, yeah, that's more for the people that will actually use the model. Uh, Hongyu, um, I think you had yeah. a question. Yeah. Uh, what was the command you used before renorm? I, I missed it, sorry. The command used before, before you, renorm? Yeah. Uh, actually, I don't know. What did I use before renorm? Check. Oh, I was just plotting and okay. okay. So I defined the, the model with the model command, and then I've just been plotting, right? Okay. Got it. Thank is you. That, is that what? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I thought there was an additional step you um, went. No, no. All right, thank okay, you. so at any point you can uh, you can use the show command. I like to clean the screen, and then say show all. And that will show you everything, right? Including starting with the data that you have loaded, a whole bunch of information about your situation with the data and the fit. And it shows you this, the, the list of your parameters, which is the thing that you're gonna be paying attention from now. This, what's going on with these parameters? What's going on with your statistics, okay? And again, it says, um, well, right now it's, it's giving you a warning and maybe I should go through this. I hope I'm not going to confuse you with this, but I just wanted to show the difference or the importance of uh, grouping the data after you reduce a particular observation. And this is, this is appearing because um, there are some beans that have too little number of counts and that's bad for your statistics. So it's, it's always gonna give you this warning no matter what you do. Um, if I will ignore, I think if I ignore, that happens typically at high energies where you see your, your counts are going down. If I will ignore data, that, that warning will go away. Uh, but before we do that, let me just finish with the, the, the discussion of the model. So we're at the point in which we renormalize the power law. It's closer, but you see it's still kind of far away from the data. Uh, the chi-square is pretty terrible. You want it to be close to one and it's 133. So now you can do fit. And this just, let me clean here, you do fit. And that will actually run a minimization procedure to try to find which are the values that better match the observation. How it just moves parameters around for the model until it finds the best match. And you see these two things were one before now uh, they have changed. Your chi-square has gone significantly lower. 2.6 is a huge change from 130. And if I plot the model, you see it, it kind of looks like it disappeared, but it's actually right there kind of on top of the data. 
So that's pretty good. And then you might say, well, I'm done. You know, this is, this is amazing. But it turns out that um, the devil is in the details. And now perhaps the most important thing that you should do at this point is to look at your residuals. And there are different plots you can do with expect to look at essentially what is left after you apply a particular model. So this model is working great in the sense that it's giving you a good representation for the entire distribution of photons. But if I want to, for example, just look at the ratio, and I can do plot ratio just like that, uh, that, that will be the data over the model. Then you see, actually this, this is a bad ratio plot because it doesn't show what I want, but there are, there are things that are not fully fitted by the model. So what I wanna do now is to stop here. And again, I'm, this might not be the best decision in terms of, of teaching, but I want to stop because I don't like to use observations uh, that hasn't been regrouped properly because of this, this problem with some beans being very, having too few counts. So I'm gonna stop here and I'm going to get out of expect. You don't have to do, oh, if you're following me, then you should do this. Um, and I'm going to go back to the list of files that we had. And I mentioned these two files, the ones that have this thing called oversample 3.0.pha. Those are the same source .pha files for the, for the two modules that have been regrouped, ribbon uh, to have a better signal. So some of the bins are grouped together into a single one to have a better signal. And I'm not gonna tell you exactly how, how this is done. I really hope Brian will cover, but if he doesn't, I'll, we'll, we'll find a way to explain you this. So what I wanna do is to go back to expect and load. I'm gonna load those files instead of the ones that we did before. <clears throat> By the way, in expect, the good thing is you can always use bash commands. Um, for example, if I do ls within expect, it, it, it does show, shows me the files in my current directory. So uh, just as we did before, I'm gonna do data one column one, and then the, the first observation. Then I'm gonna do for module B, I'm gonna do two column two. Great. Um, I don't know if you remember, but before we had over 4,000 channels, now we have 2,600 or so. And this is because this observation has been regrouped. The channels have been regrouped um, in, in bigger channels just to increase the signal in them. I'm gonna open the window. Maybe big so everybody can see. And now I'm going to uh, plot the data just as we did before. Now you see you don't go to 4,000 channels. Then I'm gonna plot the logarithm of it. And you see this looks much uglier. And it's because the data has been grouped until the energies that I care and the rest is just left alone. So it looks really terrible. Um, we set plot to energies, to plot in energies instead of channels. Then you see that much more clearly. Essentially, I care to, um, regroup the data until the 79 or 80 kV limit, and then the rest it was left unchanged. So we're gonna ignore things. And now I'm gonna show you quickly how you can ignore everything at once. You can do ignore for every spectrum, and then you can do the two limits, zero to three using the dots, and then comma 79 to infinity. And that does ignores the data below 3 kV, the data above 79 kV in both a spectrum all at once. So if we plot that, we got a nice spectrum right there. So now quickly, I'm gonna redefine the model as we did before, model ho. Let's say I use the defaults, defaults, chi square is still terrible. I plot that, the power is way too high. Renorm. Okay, go closer, but still not the right shape. Then I fit. Um, 
at this point, I want to mention something because these parameters are linked to the first two, as I mentioned before. Clearly, these parameters will not be free parameters. The only two parameters that are free to vary are the first two. These are the two that the minimization algorithm is moving around to find the best fit. Chi square went to six, though, as I thought before, we got two. And the reason why now it's larger is because, because the data has been grouped, now your statistics are better. So things matter more. When you, when you look at this chi square, which is uh, um, a measure of how good your fit is, uh, this is very sensitive to the signal. If you have high signal, the small changes, the small deviations between the data and the model are gonna matter more. So because now we have grouped the data to have a better signal, this number becomes a little bit larger. If I plot the model, it still looks pretty good, um, but now we're gonna go to the ratio. Plot ratio. And this looks a little bit better now. It looks better because we have regrouped the data so we have better signal and we can see better what things are doing. However, you can with an expert uh, do more rebinning. The difference is if you rebin with an expect is just for plotting purposes. It's not going to change anything about the data or the statistics. But I personally like to rebin pretty much a lot because that always um, will, will blow up any sort of spectral features you might have. Sometimes you see a feature and it's, if, if you try to see here at high energies, it's hard to tell what's going on because um, the error bars are very large and there is there are too many points and it's hard to tell is that you know is that a line or it's just some statistical fluctuation of the data so you can get more clarity by rebinning your data and again this rebin is if you do it in XP, it's just going to change the plot it's not going to change anything else about the observation nor is going to change the statistics everything else is going to mathematically be the same but visually it looks better so you do that with, with a command called setplot. Setplot is a general command to manipulate the way your, your plotting looks like. And in this case, you're gonna do setplot rebin, and you're gonna provide two numbers that have to do with the signal to noise that you want and the number of channels that you want to group to achieve that. So there is not a really strict rule. You can just play with those numbers pretty much as much as you want until you get a plot that looks okay to you. Um, for simplicity, I'd like to keep the two pretty much the same. So let's just start with 10. The first one is a real number, so you need to put the dot. And the second one is the channel, so it's integer, no dot. So 10, 10. You see that group a little bit here, but the rest is still about the same. So what happens if I go to maybe 50? It looks a lot better, at least to my eyes. Now I can see a little bit better what's going on here. There is this big bump here. Uh, this part is not being affected too much. We can go crazy. Let's say, oh, let me try 500. That's probably too much. So you barely have any points because you have grouped too much. And, but you can see the error bars are tiny, right? You're putting all your signal into a few bins. Um, however, this is a good way to tell whether a feature is real or not. If it is real, it should be there whenever you group too much. But let's go back to maybe something like 80, which is, uh, I think it's a good number for the observation. Okay. So what we have here is the ratio of the data to the model that you have defined. In this case, we define a power law model, right? So this is what is left. You know, you saw it was a pretty decent fit, but there is still all these features. And these are actually real astrophysical features. This is what you see here is, is an, a line, an emission line due to iron, likely coming from the accretion disk. This is reflection. Actually, this whole thing is a reflection feature. This is iron, this is iron in absorption. And this big thing is called the Compton hump, which is produced by electron scattering. We're not gonna go over the details of what this all means, but this it just suffice to say that at this point, you can actually see 
um, what is left, what is important in your observation, um, as opposed to when you were, for example, just plotting the data. If you were just plotting the data, you see this and you see, oh, there is nothing there. It's just pure power law. But that is not true. That is, once, once you remove that continuum, you can see that there is a lot of uh, features that are left to be fitted. And this is, this is where the cool stuff is. A lot of the cool stuff comes from these small features because suddenly you're saying, oh, I, I have iron. It's come from reflection. So there is an accretion disk and maybe I can tell how fast the accretion disk is rotating, things like that. So there's a lot of physics contained in these small features, which by the way, they're not that small. They could be a lot smaller than this. Okay, so before we go into something more complicated, what I've done so far is uh, not the best way to feed even the continuum because there are two missing ingredients. One is um, the fact that you see that these two spectra are not aligned with each other perfectly. And this is because the two instruments, the two detectors are almost the same detector, but they're not identical. Nothing that you produce in real life becomes exactly identical. So there are small differences between what each detector will see, especially regarding the overall flux that each one uh, will predict. So because we're applying exactly the same model to both of them, that model is not going to work perfectly in both cases. So a simple way to deal with this is to modify our model to account for a small shift, a small constant shift between the two um, observations. If I show all, I see my list of parameters and my model. What I want to do is to add a constant in front of the power law that will account for this small difference, right? And this is a very powerful command is we can do this. Let me clean. Oh, what happened? Okay, I cannot do it anymore. Um, you can do edit model or edit mo, and then you can add one change to the model. You can change one component at a time. So in this case, I'm gonna add a constant, multiplying the power law that I have before, okay? So it's gonna ask me, okay, what is that constant factor you want it to be for the first data group? And I just want one of them to vary, not both of them at the same time because I wouldn't achieve anything. So the first one, I'm gonna set it to one. And I'm gonna freeze it to one, but we're gonna do that later. For now, I say, I want it to be one. And the second one, I also want it to be one. So you see now you have a constant factor in front of the power law for both, um, for both observations. The important thing now is that I want this one to not change, not to be changed during the fitting procedure. And to do that, we use a command freeze. So you can freeze parameters. If I say freeze, and I, you, you always refer to one parameter by this number, the, the, the number of the parameter that is in the first column. If I say freeze one, and I do show again, now this one appears frozen. Whenever you see something like this next to a parameter, it means that the parameter is, is free to vary. You can unfreeze a parameter or thaw the parameter with the command thaw. If I do thaw one now and show, it's, it's free to vary again. So let's go ahead and freeze it. And I hope it's clear why I'm freezing the parameter. Just because I want one of the two spectrum to move around, not both of them at the same time. And now I'm gonna fit again. So this one, because it's frozen, stays at one. The second one moved a little bit, in just a little bit. From one, it went to 1.03 maybe. But if you plot the, the ratio now, you can see the two spectral lines much better, right? So this, that accounts for that small difference between the detectors, okay? So, so far we covered then how to define the model, how to edit the model with the edit mo command, uh, how to feed the data and, um, and how to manipulate parameters. Freeze and thaw are the two commands to 
make them uh, stay at the same value or to very freely do in the fitting procedure. Okay. Um, I think just with this, what we covered so far, you, you have the basic to start feeding data and playing with things. My suggestion is try to reproduce everything I've done and try to play with freezing and non-freezing parameters. Maybe you can play with different models if you feel adventurous enough um, and trying to understand what that does to your data and, and to you know what what does what do, that does to the fit. As I said, the mission is always to get this value closer to one. So in this case, we're far away from that. Um, we still we still will need a model that takes account from all this. We have models that actually work very well, but um, they're a bit more complicated and they need to be installed. And I don't think all of you have it. So we can, I'm happy to go over that in a different session if you're all interested. Um, for now, before we finish, I'd like to mention a few more things that you can do. I'm only showing the ratio plot, but there are other plots that you can, you can, you can and you should look at. For example, you can plot, um, why can I cannot do it anymore? You can plot the residuals uh, and they show something slightly different. Um, this is, will be essentially data minus model. You see the big iron line there. In this case, um, you don't see the big bump because in a residual it's just, you know, the, the difference of two numbers is different from the ratio of two numbers. Uh, you can plot the, what is called the del chi is, and this is essentially your um, your residuals in, in sigma units. So data minus model over the, the error of each channel. Then you see essentially it's something similar. Um, this might not be the best example because it kind of looks the same as a ratio plot, but sometimes depending on your data, uh, you can get to see things better one way or another. And finally, Another plot that I like to, to look is at the chi. And what this does is it shows you the contributions to the total chi square from each channel. So how much, when you see the, the chi square, if I go back and say, for example, show, show all, and you see your chi square is six, um, that's a single number for the entire fit. But perhaps uh, I want to know which are the which are the energies? Where is the model failing, right? What is what matters the most? And that's what this plot is gonna tell you. Again, it's not the greatest example because if I do, you, by the way, you can do plots, two plots or more at the same time. If I do, if I plot the ratio and the chi, they look pretty much the same because this is obviously what is causing the most damage, right? The fact that you don't have a model for the line, you don't have a model for the absorption, you don't have a model for the Compton home. But, but there are cases in which the features are not so obvious. You have a, you already have several model components and you're not necessarily understanding very well where the big differences are coming from. It's also because um, in your observation, if you think about the total, if you, once again, if you plot the data, you can see you have a lot more signal and low energies that are high energies. So a ratio plot, it just shows that, it just shows the ratio of things of the data to the model, but it doesn't really tell you the fact that the ratio is large here, it doesn't necessarily means that this is as meaningful as, the, as this ratio over here. So in fact, um, if we go to the details, the ratio at the Compton hump is larger than the ratio at the line. But statistically, this matters less than this because your signal is higher here at the iron line. You can see it on the size of the arrow bars are, are smaller than the arrow bars here. So if I, instead of the ratio, look at the chi-square plot, you can see now that the line is what matters the most. It's contributing a lot to the total chi-square 
as opposed to this. See, so these are these are um, these are plots that show a slightly different versions of the of the situation that you have with the fig. So it's good to look. I personally, I like to look at everything. Some people you'll see a lot of papers where they only show the ratio plot, and I think that sometimes can be misleading because it doesn't really tell you where um, most of the statistics was um, was was mattering for the fit. Um, so we've been going on for about an hour now. I'll stop one more time and see if you guys have questions. And maybe, I don't know if we want to continue or just leave it here. I don't know if you, have you all been following this, uh, like doing it yourself right now, or you just listening? You're, you're doing it yourself, so. Uh, okay, so any questions? I'll give you a minute um, to have, think. I have something. Um, at first I could see the reduced chi, like chi-squared, but now I can't see it for some reason. What do you mean you can't see it? Like I get chi-squared and another chi-squared, but I don't get the reduced chi-squared. When I do I'm seeing the same. Yeah, I can't I'm see so, that I'm either. sorry, this, this is my bad. I forgot that. Um, my version of XPEC is actually old, it's from 2018. And for some reason, at some point they decided maybe there was too much information in that thing and then decided not to include the reduced chi-square. Because mm -hmm. the reduced chi-square is something that you can simply compute by taking, it's, it's the ratio of your chi-square to the number of degrees of freedom, right? Right. Uh, okay. And by the way, I didn't mention what this is, I, I hope, you all understand, but just very quickly, your number of degrees of freedom is going to be the number, the total number of, of beans that you have in your data. The total, this is the total number of uh, data points that you have minus the number of free parameters in your model. So you have 1086 beans and you have one, two, three free parameters. So that's why you have 1083 degrees of freedom, okay? So obviously the more free parameters you have in a model, the more, the less degrees of freedom you're gonna have. Um, and yeah, so that, that affects your, your test statistics, of course, okay? Um, a couple of things I wanted to maybe go quickly about the parameters, you can always, do things like show free, and it will show you the free only the free parameters that you have. Here it, it seems silly, but sometimes when you have an actual model that has, you, you could have you know twenty or thirty, a list of thirty parameters, and it gets complicated to just visually look at which are free and which are not. Um, if you want, I can go five to ten more minutes very quickly with just adding a bit more complication to the model so you can see more of what happens. Uh, if you have questions, just interrupt me. Um, so for example, if I want to now do a simple model to fit the line and maybe this, this, this is an edge, this an atomic feature called an edge. Um, I have some tools to do that in a very simple way. Oh, I'm sorry, no, I have something I forgot. I said two important things. One was the adding the constant, right? So I had the two, the two detectors aligning nicely here, but something that you always need to do with any X-ray observation is to add an absorption model because any X-ray source that we're seeing is gonna suffer of absorption uh, due to the interstellar medium in our galaxy at the very least. Then it can, it can have any other kind of absorption. But at the very least, every X-ray observation, every X-ray source out there is going to have to go through some of the material in the ISM. And there are different models to do that, but I'll tell you right now, you just have to worry about one. It's the one that we all use is likely the most the, mo the better one, the most useful one, and it's called TV apps. So we can do that right now by um, by modifying again. I can edit the model. 
and say TV apps times, oh, sorry, maybe I'll do it like this, constant as we have it, and then TV apps is the model. It's a multiplicative model, as I said, is it, it, any absorption thing is gonna multiply. And this multiplies the power law or whatever you have before, right? So now it asks me for the free parameter is called NH is the column density of hydrogen. So how much material in term of hydrogen, which is the most abundant thing, um, the most abundant element, how much of that is in your line of sight, essentially between the source and new star, right? So this particular number in this particular model is measured in units of 10 to the 22 centimeters square per centimeter square, right? It has units of, of uh, density. So um, there are places, there are surveys that will tell you what is the expected value for a given line of sight. Again, we can cover the scenes um, in more detail later, but for most sources, you probably have at least a rough idea what this value should be. And for this black hole, we know it's somewhere around 0 0.5 or 0 0.6 in those units in 10 to the 22. So let's use maybe 0 0.6. And another trick, if I do minus one right after the number here, I'm telling XPEC, I'm gonna, sign, I'm gonna put in 0 0.6, but I wanna leave it free because I don't want that to vary. And then it's gonna ask the same for the second observation. I want it to be the same, so I just press enter. So this way now NH is linked to the first one and this one is frozen. What is this doing? It's causing some absorption here. It's absorbing the model, meaning now the data is, is uh, the ratio is, is larger here. Um, something we didn't cover is in plotting different things, you can actually plot the model that you have. So that's also very useful. And you can say just plot model and you just plot the model that you have. Um, I like there are different versions. Um, I like to plot in EE mode, which is the model multiplied by energy square. Uh, it's a better representation of what we typically want to see. So what you're seeing here is a power law with this photon index of 1.6. And this curvature here is produced by that, this, this absorption model. If we want to see this a little bit better, so let me do it um, in a better way. So for example, in these units, a power law with gamma two will be, should be a horizontal line, right? If now I set this absorption to zero, which is what we had before, we had no absorption, we should only see a power law. So this is a power law with photon index of two plotted in, in this particular units. You might have heard of, <coughs> sorry, new F new. People like to plot new F new when they're plotting flux versus frequency. We're essentially plotting flux versus energy. So what we're doing is energy times flux in energy and for that, we do this EE mode a command that gives you the right units. So it's a good unit because it means that your energy distribution in versus the, the, the photon dis the distribution of photons versus energy is flat for a gamma equals two. So that's, a, that's just a, com a very, very useful kind of thing to do. Now, if I go back and put some absorption, to the second parameter, I'll go back to the 0.6. So we see the effects of adding some absorbing material in the line of sight. It's just eating up your soft energy flux. And this thing here is actually an atomic feature. It's an atomic edge. If you overshoot it and say you go to one, it's not that much, maybe 10, would be a pretty large column. Um, it's absorbing a lot more. You get almost to 10 kV is feeling the absorption of the material. So this is important because as I said, this is, has to be there for pretty much any X-ray observation. The exact value uh, might not always be very well known. 
And in particular with NUSTAR, it's kind of tricky to fit for it because NUSTAR, as you have seen, it starts at 3 kV. So most of this absorption occurs at lower energies. So sometimes you, you really need the help of a low energy coverage instrument to get this number right. Or if you have a good, a good source for the number, you just adopt it and just leave it, um, leave it fixed to that as I'm doing here. Free norm, fit. So this, this is now a fit that includes that absorption. So this is very important, these TBFs. A small subtlety about this absorption model is that it depends on the abundances, the solar abundances for the elements that were assumed. So there are slightly different um, standards for essentially different people have measured different abundances. And there is a bit of a, I would say controversy, but some people say this should be the solar abundances and somebody went and said, well, I measured with a different method and I found slightly different values. So there is a command, a command in, in expert called Abund that if you just type that, it tells you which particular um, standard of abundance is, is used. In this case, this one is called uh, ANGR, a which stands for Anderson Graves, and is this particular paper. Personally, and in particularly with this model TBS, I would recommend using a different set, which is called VILM. If I say now Abun, it shows me I'm using VILM, which stands for Vilms, Allen, and McRae, this paper from 2000, which was a revised measurement for the solar abundances. And some people will argue, well, I prefer these ones, I prefer these ones, but in this case, these are the recommended abundances to use with this model, with TBFs. And there is a small difference, but sometimes it's perceptible. So if I, if I plot now with this new set of abundances, you see maybe that this changed a little bit. So um, sometimes it's relevant, sometimes it's not. Um, I think all that you need to know is that if you're using TV apps, you better use these abundances and that's it. Perhaps the most important thing is to make sure you know which abundances you're using. And if you're writing a paper, you have to say which one do you use? Because then if I want to reproduce your results, um, and I don't know exactly how you, and you know, which abundances you use is not going to be possible to guess. Okay. Um, so you have the absorption model, you have the constant factor between the two PMA. Um, very quickly, adding a more complicated model. And this I'm going to just go quickly and, and, and let you just think about it. So I want to add now maybe a Gaussian profile for the, for the mission line that we see. And I can go again to edit mode and I write my model the way it is, TB apps, then PO, and then I'm adding because Gaussian is an additive model, I'm adding a Gaussian to the power law and you see, is inside the parentheses because I want the absorption to always act on any sort of model that I have. And obviously the constant to as well act in anything that I have. And I mistype. There we go. Okay, so this one has, it's gonna have three parameters. It, it asks for what's the, what's the energy for the center of the Gaussian. I'm gonna leave it at 6.5. And as for the sigma, I'm just gonna arbitrarily make it uh, maybe small and freeze it. And the normalization, I'm just gonna go with, I don't know, if I do maybe 10 to the minus four, let's see what that does. It didn't do much to the observation. So maybe it needs to be bigger. So what if I do, okay, now let me introduce a new command, which is, new par. I can change the value of a given parameter. I, I think I've already done this a few times, but I never explained it. New par, you can say um, the parameter number. In this case, I want to change parameter seven and the value that you want to assign. I want to go with 10 to minus two, for example. And that I will change that parameter now to 10 to minus two. 
okay? And if I look at what it does to the data, oh, I overshoot, too strong, right? So maybe I go back and say, okay, I want it to be 10 to minus three, and that is not too bad, right? So if I plot the model right now, you see the model now includes this very narrow emission line right there where I put it. Um, and I can just fit for it as well, just to get a slightly better uh, fit to the data. And this is what it's doing. It's a very narrow line, but what I'm observing is a, it's a broader line. So it's not doing a great job as a narrow line. So maybe I let Sigma to go, right? Sigma has been frozen to 10 to minus three. Then I wanna do thaw and the parameter number, which is six, and that will make it for now just free. You see it has a zero error because it hasn't been fitted for. So I can just fit and it went to, it didn't change much. So it's not really wanted to do much to it. Okay, so another thing I can do, another big feature here is this absorption dip here, which is, a, is an atomic edge caused by iron and it's been relativistically broadened. I can tell you some other time what all that means, but there is a nice model to, to do a simple version of it, which is called a smatch or a smear edge. So we're gonna do edit model, constant, TV apps, power law, Gaussian. And then I can always do it. For example, at the end, I can add some other multiplicative model because it's, it's an absorption thing, it's called a smatch. This one has several parameters. It has an energy for where the position of that edge wants it to be. I'm gonna do 7.5 and I'm gonna change. Now I'm gonna do something a bit more advanced which is changing these numbers here. So the second number is a Delta. I don't wanna change it. So I just do comma, comma, but I want to change the minimum and maximum values. So I don't want this thing to move around any way it wants. I want it to be between seven KV and maybe nine KV, because that's the region where I see this thing, right? So I don't want it just to go freely anywhere. So I'm asking to the minimization procedure to move the parameter only within those ranges. Tau, I'm gonna say 0.5. It, this parameter just controls how strong the feature is going to be. This you don't need to worry, it's an index, you leave it as it is, it's, it's a frozen value. And this one, you can just also leave it to 10 for the moment. Okay. So now the three parameters I have is the energy and the tau. What that is doing, as it is, it's a really pretty good representation for that dip. Again, I can always fit and see what happens. I fit it better the edge, I fit it better the line. You can see what's going on with the parameters. The line energy changed it a little bit. Um, the tau went pretty high. So it's just finding the, the best combination that works for this observation. And you can see already, we went from something that was like six to 1.7. So we're getting pretty close to a very good chi square. So that's kind of the game, trying to you start taking care of the big residuals that you have in order, in order to um, to get a, a better fit. Hopefully all based in some reasonable physical interpretation. Um, and now there's this, this thing here. I don't think I have a good way to model this simply because this is a big feature. Maybe, maybe we could try to put another Gaussian, but I'm not sure what's going to do. What I wanted to do now is to tell you about one important command that I should have mentioned at the beginning, which is save. You want to save your progress as much as you can because sometimes, especially before doing a big change to the model or a fit, um, things can go bad. Can, things can just um, move too much from where you were and maybe you like the situation as it was before. Uh, say we're here and we want to try something radical to fit this uh, this big dip at the, at the high energies. So maybe we want to save what we have. And for that, we just say save all. You can, you could save just a model, maybe just the data. 
if you want to save all, say save all, and then the name of the file that you want. So you can say whatever you want, test one, for example. And if you actually look at the uh, your files in your folder, it has created a, um, a file called test1.xcm, which is the, the extension for expert files. If I look at that, if you look inside the file, you're gonna see the basic information expect needs to recover the feed that you have in this particular moment right now. So it has the data, it has the ignore command, this is all in channels, everything that you ignore, which method are you using, the abundances, for example. It has a whole bunch of information and then the model with all the model parameters. So, you know, if I if I destroy this feed, if I screwed up everything, or if I simply just finish and I just wanna go away and have lunch and come back and continue, I can always load this uh, and, 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 and continue from what I was. The one thing that um, is sort of annoying to me, it won't save is the plotting commands. So the, the set plot command ribbon that we did to, to have a nicer view of the data is not going to be saved. So for example, right now I can just leave expect and say I go back. Ah, okay. And then to load the, the, the file, you use the, um, the add symbol and then the name of the file, test1.xcmn. And then that will actually just load the data, load the model and set everything as it was. So this is very important to remember, just save as much as you can because um, you never know, things go sometimes crazy, a model can crash or whatever. So for example, if I plot the ratio right now, you see it's not being rebin as I had it before and it's in channels. So I have to repeat the set plot energy to have it in energy and maybe the set plot rebin as I had it before, I had it 80, 80, and now I'm back to what I was before. Then plotting. But the feet and everything else is just exactly what we have, right? So I think I'll stop here. Um, any last questions you might have at the moment? Everything's super clear. Well, um, I know this is a lot of information, especially if you never done expect before. So I, um, I appreciate that it might take a while for you to digest the information. I think the best thing to do for you now is to start from scratch. Uh, once we close this, I mean, not right now, whenever you feel more relaxed, you start from the very beginning, trying to remember the steps uh, without looking notes or without looking at the video or anything and see how much you can reproduce, how, how close you can get to what we got before, you know, just by remembering yourself. Um, Maybe a couple more things. So I, I gave you the link for the manual. So there is obviously a lot of information there. If you don't remember about some command or all the commands are listed there, all the models are listed there. When you are in XPEC, let me uh, share my screen again. You can, I think you can always uh, do the question sign and then it shows you already a whole bunch of information about all the different commands that you have so there is many commands we haven't we haven't covered but if you don't remember how was that abundant thing you can type that and then it shows you the command it shows you what it is for and a you know a brief syntax for it right and i'm pretty sure you can do i don't think i ever try but you can do probably if you want information about plotting, yeah, you do question mark plot. So the name of the particular command you're interested in, and then it shows you just that one. And in this case, you can see you, there are many different things you can plot, right? We cover EE model, we cover L data, um, Delta, Chi, but there are a few more things. You can play with all this stuff and see what they do. Um, 
but maybe after a few days or maybe a week or two, we can have a different session where we go into more advanced stuff about the fitting procedure, fitting algorithm. There is a difference between the test statistics and the fitting statistics. Um, there's a whole, a whole bunch of more um, advanced concepts that we can cover and more complicated models as well. Okay. Uh, I'll stop recording and maybe if you, there is any lingering question, just let me know. Stop